the Maine Warden Service canine team travels throughout Maine to bring missing persons to safety and to protect our natural resources. I'm Katie Yates, and in this special bonus season of Fish and Game Changers, I'm running with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife's canine team. This is the final episode of this special three-part series, and I'm sitting down with canine corporal Lucas Balanzo, landowner relations corporal Dave Shabbat, and game warden Chris McCabe to learn more about how they became game wardens, why they love the work they do, and to hear more about the special relationship they have with their canine partners. Many current game wardens grew up in hunting and fishing families and always knew they wanted to work for the warden service. Dave, for example, started working for the department when he was just 18 years old. I was a deputy warden. Um, I first started doing job shadows right when I graduated from uh, high school with uh, my district warden. Um, and then uh, he asked me to be his deputy. So I became a deputy warden. At that point, it was, uh, got the dress like a game warden, but I didn't get paid. So it didn't was get a. paid? No. It was no. for free? Yeah, it was for free. Well, going through college and uh, doing that, I was working several different jobs and working for the department for free as a deputy game warden. So volunteering, really. Volunteering, yeah. Writing summonses picking up nuisance animals, all for free. Um, and then uh, graduated from college, and it was perfect timing because they were given the test that, uh, that spring. So I ended up, uh, when I took the test, there was 15 positions open, uh, 1,500 people applied. So we had a 1% chance of being hired on. Wow. So it's 21 years old, for, fortunate enough, I uh, got hired on my first time through, and Moved to Dakwam was my first district, and as soon as Lucas started, started with the warden service right yeah. after college. You know, I still had a year of school left, and I ended up getting hired as a as a Maine deputy game warden. So I decided to stay in Maine, um, work as a as a boating deputy, and, and finish my last year of school, or at least mm. have a have a degree. It uh, ended up working out. You know, I so I, I worked as a boating deputy on Sebago Lake here mm. in southern Maine um, for a summer. A uh, full-time application process opened up that summer, and I was hired full-time. Uh, started the police academy in January that or December that year. So, um, so it was just quick. Yeah, it just rolled. You know, the cards all fell. Fell. You know, everything landed right. Timing was right. It's not an easy job to get, and it takes a long time to get there. Mm. And I was I was pretty fortunate that everything played out, and I was able to get my dream job at. 20 years old mm. in a full-time full -time capacity. Chris spent an interesting season in the backcountry helping with a Canada Lynx study before he became a game warden. It's like the backcountry experience when I was working on the Lynx project. Uh, I did a lot of backcountry snowmobiling by myself. Can and you explain a little bit what the Lynx project is? Yeah, so the Lynx project at the time, uh, we were trapping Canada Lynx and radio collaring them in the northern reaches of Maine. We were up there uh, the months of January, February, March, and we would set out uh, live traps for the lynx. Um, they were large traps that we would use where they would actually go in. We'd set the traps. Uh, most of them are chain link uh, with the ore that drops down. And what we would do is we would go in and put snow all over, cover the, the pan, the trigger pan, with snow, so the lynx would come in and they would set the trap off and get trapped in there. And then we would uh, tranquilize them and put radio collars on them to study them. And at the time, there were a lot of lynx up there. Um, and that year, lynx were getting killed by fisher. And it was very interesting because what would happen is they, the radio collars would go dead, we would go out and find them. And what we were finding was fisher were really preying on lynx up there, which was really interesting because you think about a lynx that's 45 to 50 pounds roughly and being taken down by a small fisher. We would find them where they would, the fisher would actually dismember a lynx. So we'd find an arm here, a leg here. Oh, it was like a, yeah, it was like a crime scene. And you'd see the drag marks. And I can remember one time we were, uh, we were, we'd followed a track mark where the fisher had dragged a piece of the cat off and we were like what's going on over here so we looked in the cedar log and we could see the lynx leg so we were pulling on it and i looked behind and there was a fisher grabbing onto it so we were, we were in a tug of war with the fisher 
But it was a really cool study. Um, it was a really good experience for myself. And I had applied for that position to help my resume for the warden service. And it was a total volunteer position. I didn't get paid. And at that time, I, I rode along with the game warden in Clayton Lake one time while I was out there. And that was the time when I started applying for the warden service. So, And then I uh, got hired by the warden service and went to the academy. And These guys are working their dream jobs. But I wonder, what about the work is so rewarding for them? What are some of your favorite parts of your job? Um, it's changed over the years. Um, initially, it was, oh, I get to, you know, do law enforcement, but uh, also be outdoors. And um, over time, it's gone more into uh, educating the public. So how do we do a better job at educating folks and uh just getting out there and, and getting people to appreciate what we do have and to kind of take ownership of it. Because mm. if people take ownership of it, they're less likely to abuse it. So the state of Maine is over 90% privately owned. That means that hunters, anglers, hikers, ATV riders, birders, and others have more than likely recreated on privately owned land at some point in time. As Landowner Relations Corporal, Dave works to enhance trust between landowner and uh, land user. Is that why you got into the landowner relations program because of that side of things? Yeah, the landowner relations portion has been uh, uh, great. I've always believed in uh, community policing anyway. Um, again, that was just something that, you know, it was the big, big thing when I was going through college, community. It, you know, it really hit home because, again, you have to be, especially being a district game board, and you have to be part of your community. Um, without people feeling comfortable with me, uh, trusting me it was great that people could you know felt comfortable enough to call me and carry on conversations with me and want to interact with me so um, I took that right into this um, this field of this landowner relations portion and it, it's really about just being a voice for Maine's landowners because without them uh, we won't have anything so it allows me to not only be their voice give them at least at least you know couple points of contact to know, hey, we do care. If we make that landowner happy, uh, they're more apt to uh, allow people to continue use. So. Maine being 94% privately owned, um, you know, our department relies on uh, areas for people to hunt or fish or recreate or snowmobile or ATV or, and uh, without these uh, these lands, there just wouldn't be any opportunity to even manage our wildlife. It's very important for us to uh, be able to continue to have that outreach to both the, the landowner and the land user and educate them um, on responsible use. And Part of it, I guess, a, lot, a big part of it is probably uh, educating people who recreate, so those hunters and anglers that are out there. It really is, um, and that's something that, uh, again, we've been trying to expand on is that information and education portion and um, that's something that we just can't get out on the landscape enough. We need people out there being, uh, you know, good representation of, of what Maine sportsmen are. Dave is an avid hunter and angler and this interest in the outdoors is also a motivator for Lucas. I was an, you know, I still am today very, very passionate about hunting. Mm. Um, I could sleep like a baby the night before Christmas, but like if I knew my dad was going to take me hunting the next day, I couldn't sleep at all. Um, ever since I was a little, little kid, just always, always, always loved it. Fell in love with it. My dad used to take me all the time, my uncles. Um, and it was just always something that I was like an absolute fool over. You know, this job allows me to, you know, do what I love to do, be where I want to be, dealing with people that share similar interests. And, um, you know, obviously kind of, you know, protecting what, what I love to do. So that was what really drew me to it, that it was an avenue to... For Chris, the Warden Service's 140-year history and being part of that tradition are what he finds especially rewarding. Being a game warden. Uh, I'd say my favorite thing about being a game warden is uh, the history of it has a lot to do with it. Like, I really, I really respect, like, where we are today in comparison to where we were back in the 1900s and really for me like to carry on that tradition today is super important 
um, to be a hard worker and to go out there and do the best that I can every day. Actually, yesterday was the anniversary of the main warden service. Um, so March 9th, uh, 1880 was uh, was 140 years for the main warden service. 140 years is a long time. It is, is a long time. Is that the oldest? So there isn't like uh, like we consider ourselves the oldest throughout the country, but there are some other agencies that say that they're older. But um, like I definitely think uh, the main warden services uh, definitely carried the torch throughout the years, um, and they're we are highly respected throughout the country, and people look at us uh, a lot of times to see where we're moving, what direction we're moving in. Um, definitely our search and rescue that we do, including canines is uh, very highly regarded throughout the country. In the state of Maine, we have that purpose, and uh, that's from the legislature that made us in charge of search and rescue in the state. So anybody that gets lost in the woods or waters of Maine, it's us that's going to look for them. Yeah. The wardens on the canine team have a special connection with their dogs. Like, I don't, my wife and I don't have any kids, and the dogs mean a lot to us. So it's uh, kind of like our, there are kids, like we always, uh, Kind of joke about it, but our kids have tails and fur, and and uh, I've always I've said I'm, I'm going to have to be on bereavement when my dog passes away because mm -hmm. it's just I'm not going to be able to handle it. Like she's she's almost nine and a half years old now, which is pretty old for like a police canine, yeah, yeah. and but she acts like just like the puppy she was when she was two or three years old. So hopefully we can get a few more years out of her. We we do retire them uh, once they get to a certain point where they just can't work. Um, obviously with the line of work that we do with the searches in the woods and stuff, it, it takes its toll on them. So um, we don't want them going to the point where they, they just can't be out there. Uh, it's just not fair to the dog. So um, usually about 10 to 11 years old, they'll retire. Um, and then they'll, they'll live a happy life at home. Mm -hmm. So they, they got a good life now. They're, they're definitely... Uh, they, they enjoy what they do. Yeah. I mean, they when they when they get in the truck or they get out of the truck, they know that they uh, it's special to them, um, and they they obviously have a bond with us, so it means a lot to them when they can they can be with us. Yeah, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Really? It's by far the hardest thing the warden service have ever ever tried to accomplish. I mean, I've been fortunate enough. I've done a lot of different things in this department, but running a dog and trusting a Trusting a canine is a lot different because you know you're looking for that tail wag, you're looking for the eye contact, you're looking for the nose contact to the ground, trying to read them, and it takes. Just when you start getting good, the dog's about ready to retire. So that's that saddens me. I wish we could yeah. run them forever. But so that's I feel that has to be a very profound connection to because you're constantly working with that dog to try and read what she needs or what she's expressing oh absolutely because really they're just there to please you you know she wants nothing more than to please me every single minute you know so it's really my fault if i'm not relaying the message properly uh, they're very 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 much reading what you're doing mm. so to, you have to really really got to make a mental note and uh, be conscious of what what signs you're giving to your dog because you're trying to look at them and their tail wag while they're trying to look at you and listen to your voice. So cool. I never thought about the back and forth that she's yeah, oh looking yeah. at you as much as you're looking at. Oh, her. I can I can make her false or misindicate on something just through my tone and mm -hmm. the way I'm looking or talking to her. Less talking, more watching. That's that's really yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Really so all of our um all of our dogs yeah. go home with us. They live with us. The canine mm -hmm. stuff has really become obviously a big part of my job now, uh, being the canine corporal. Um, and managing our canine team and managing trainings and, and also our other handlers and stuff. So, you know, that's become a huge, a huge part of my job and, um, you know, it's a huge passion, I guess, as well. So it's, it's um, really motivating and rewarding in that sense too, that, you know, good dog work and, and not, not, not just my own dog, but um, other, other, other members of the canine team being successful is just as rewarding as, as being successful, successful yourself. So definitely, you know, it, you know, my dream job was being game warden. Um, you know, my dream job, and then, all, and then it became be, becoming canine handler, and then it became, you know, you know, how do you give back to it? How do you contribute to it and being better? Um, and then becoming a canine, cor being the corporal of the canine team and managing things and, and trying to improve things and make things better for everybody as a whole and better serve the public and the resources. So, um, 
that's what we're doing now. Our canine team um, is really unique in the sense of what we do as far as search and rescue. There's just so much um, good work to be done and so much good work that goes into it. Um, not everybody fully understands what we do um, just because we're different than traditional police dog work. Um, a lot of times people think we work the typical German shepherd that's barking his head off in the back of a police cruiser. And um, I don't think the general public's necessarily aware of, of what our canines do in that, in that sense because we're so different. Um, my whole mindset going into this training, you know, our training, and we set up trainings and do trainings is, you know, if my kid was lost, who would I, which, which dog would I want out there? Or who would I want out there looking for him? You know, who's going to get my loved one back? You know, who's going to find my child in the quickest amount of time? You know, how can we do it the best way? And when you see that and deal with some of these families that are going through that sort of um, turmoil, to say, I don't know if that's the right term to use, but... Um, when you see that, you kind of understand the importance of what you do for, for work. Um, the public service aspect of, of the canine work in search and rescue is so, so important and unique. Um, you know, it's, it's a necessary, necessary, necessary service we need here in the state. To learn more about the Maine Warden Service and their canine team, visit mefishwildlife.com slash changers. Be sure to hit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes and special series like this one. If you happen to listen on the Apple Podcast app, be sure to give us a rating and let us know what you think.